Gary, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. So I can let everybody in? Yes. Gary, are we ready to go? I can let everybody in. Yes. Gary, are we ready to go? All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Wood, can you hear me okay? I can, Your Honor. And Mr. Means, Mr. Pryor, can you both hear me okay? I can, Your Honor, thank you. All yes, right, Mark, are we ready to proceed? Your, Your Honor, if I may, yesterday uh, I filed a motion thinking it would be convenient while we were all together to have a status conference, something that I need to bring to the, the court's attention, maybe see some direction on. Uh, before we go live, if that's possible. I think we're already live, <laughs> but we can arrange a breakout room. I did see that motion, wanted to discuss that. So um, let me confirm with the clerk. Madam Clerk, are we uh, recording live right now? All right, I know they were also having a technical issue with the FTR recording yesterday at Fremont County. So I don't know if the clerk is there, but Madam Clerk, if you could, would you please arrange for a breakout room for, uh, for me and the attorneys, please? I will do that right now, Your Honor. All right, thank you. All right, we'll be on the record here, Madam Clerk. Are we ready? Yes, we are, Your Honor. And was you had mentioned there was an FTR issue yesterday on the recording. Has that been resolved? Is it recording by FTR today? No. No, it's not recording or no, it's... No, it's not recording, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, this is case CR 2220-838 and CR 2220-755, State versus Lori Vallow and State versus Chad Daybell. Representing the state in these matters today is prosecuting attorney Rob Wood. Representing uh, Mrs. Vallow is attorney Mark Means and attorney John Pryor represents Mr. Daybell. Um, we are conducting this hearing by Zoom today. It's also being recorded on the Zoom software. The FDR recording, which we normally have also in the courtroom is not working today, but we do have this recording on Zoom and also it's being live streamed on YouTube, which creates an additional recording. So we'll go forward with that. I'll also mention we have a court reporter making a transcript of the hearing today as well. Uh, we are live streaming this on the court's YouTube channel. 
uh, for the ability of the media and public to have access to this hearing. We've got two motions scheduled uh, today. There's a motion to compel filed by the defendant Vallo that was filed on January 8th. And on January 19th, uh, there's also been a motion filed by Ms. Vallo for an order directing attorney client privilege communications. Um, Mr. Means, your client does have the right to attend this hearing. Uh, she doesn't have to, but she's obviously got the right to attend all proceedings. Does she intend to appear at this hearing today? No, Your Honor. All right, so she'll waive the right of her appearance for today's hearings? Correct, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Pryor, also with Mr. Daybell, is he intending to appear at these hearings today? No, Judge, we discussed that. Mr. Daybell and I discussed that yesterday, and he's going to waive it this time. All right, and we'll proceed forward without the attendance of the defendants in this case. This time, then, the court will first take up the motion to compel that was filed in this case. Um, as I mentioned, that was filed on January 8th in regards to some discovery requests that were um, sent to the prosecutor in December. The motion to compel indicated there were no responses. And so I've reviewed the motions as well as the response filed by the state in opposition. And at this time, Mr. Means, if you want to argue your motion to compel, you may do so. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Uh, specifically, the court said some procedural issues. Uh, on 1215, we filed a, I filed a motion to disqualify the prosecutor based on discovery of some communications between uh, Mr. Wood and Summer Shiplet. On 1217, I served a specific set of discovery requests identifying specific people which are relevant or material or perspective or actual witnesses listed by the prosecution in this case, asking for the communications between Mr. Wood himself specifically and these individuals. There was no objection, there was no response filed, there was no request for an extension of time at any time filed by the prosecutor in this case. Hence on, on January 8th, on the morning of the ruling regarding the motion for disqualification, I filed my motion to compel. In the state's response, they acknowledged that they did not respond in a timely manner. Rule 16 of the Idaho Criminal Rules is very clear in that it is mandatory of the prosecutor to produce any and all evidence that tend to get, tends to negate the guilt of the accused. And these include statements of witnesses, prospective witnesses, and other things. We know in today's time that statements of witnesses can come in various forms. We've learned in the motion to disqualify that these statements can come in the form of recording, verbal, they can come through text messages, emails, recordings, voicemails. The obligation is the same. You have to produce these statements. And if we look closely at rule 16, when you don't file a response or you don't file an objection within the 14 days, it is clear they are waived. Now we have an argument coming back saying, well, there's multiple objections that I would like to assert when the prosecution acknowledges receiving the discovery request and doesn't file, rule 16 is clear. Now there are quite a few red herring arguments in his, his response. I think these are waived. If there's a specific one in which the court would like me to address, I can. But Rule 16 is clear. The statements of these witnesses, including Mr. Wood himself as a witness in my case, are relevant to this matter. The people that we listed specifically in the discovery request, as I mentioned, are the witnesses and or the defendants in this case, which at some evidence has been produced and some of these individuals have been identified. The state is attempting to shoehorn an objection and a, a non-obligation into a work product doctor deciding that there are notes or memorandums. We don't mention notes or memorandums in our discovery request. We ask for the text messages, emails, conversations, voice recordings, whatever. We know for a fact based on the transcript that was provided to the court that Mr. Wood has had personal conversations with Colby. We know for a fact with Summer Shiplet. We know for a fact based on other evidence that he's had conversations with the Woodcocks. He has made himself a witness in this case and subject to there are multiple reasons as to why this has to be produced as a witness and multiple reasons as a prosecutor while he has to produce this uh, to, to, to further our case and to again comply with rule 16 and possibly negating the guilt of my client. He has refused to do such. He had an opportunity to respond and he chose not to respond nor issue an objection. Specifically in rule 16, if he wanted to issue any of these objections that he cites now in his response, he had an obligation to do so. And he had an obligation to do so in a specific manner. 
in objecting to specifically what was requested and he chose not to respond at all. Rule 16 is clear. The red herring arguments don't hold water. When these statements come into the prosecutor and he chooses to engage in conversations with multiple witnesses, he is one, making himself a witness, Two, he is collecting statements, and these statements have to be produced, whether they are to him personally or to his agents or detectives. Here, we've asked for these statements to be produced. Ironically, they were due before the motion to disqualify the prosecutor, and there was no response. I think that irony has to sit right in front of this motion that had we received that evidence that he'd had further communication with other witnesses we would have presented that at the motion to disqualify we're now in a position where we have to come back and request this information by order of the court i don't see any means or grounds for the prosecutor not to be ordered to comply with this specific quest i think that ship has sailed the only thing that you can really i think decide within the discretion, reasonably within the discretion of the court is what kind of sanctions are we going to issue in this case to prevent this communication in the further in, happening in the future. Uh, if, if the court doesn't grant this motion, we're, we're on a dangerous precipice that says we can, del we can just deliver properly discovery requests and they can be outright ignored and not brought to the attention of the court until the propounding party brings a motion to compel that's a problem and a dangerous precedent. Your Honor, the, these statements are relevant, whether they came in on his personal cell phone, on his business cell phone, on his business phone, on his business email, on his grandmother's Hotmail account, it doesn't matter. He is the holder of these statements and has the obligation to produce them. Your Honor, we ask that you would enter our motion to compel order a timely response to these discovery responses or at least make available access to these communications and that the cost and other sanctions be considered by this court regarding this motion. All right, I have a, a few questions, Mr. Means. There was, uh, as you noted, it was filed late, but there was an objection filed uh, on January 8th. And then also there was a notice of discovery uh, disclosure on January 14th. That um, talks about an addendum B, which is a witness list, and it's not included in the pleading. So um, in some of your pleadings, Mr. Means, you've indicated you haven't received anything at all. And then subsequently, it appears to me at least there have been some disclosures. So I'd like you to outline to me what you have in fact received since filing the motion requesting this additional discovery um, including what was in, involved in that addendum B that was provided. Sure, sure, Your Honor. I, I, I would note, obviously, for the timeline, that my discovery request regarding the communication between Mr. Wood and these witnesses was prior to this discovery response, was prior to the disclosure of witnesses from the state, which ironically leaves Summer Shiflett off of his list after the motion to disqualify. What we specifically requested, and we have not received any to date, is a specific response to this discovery request and or identifying any and all information that they maintain complies with this discovery request. The other things in which we receive it, it will be brought to the attention of the court at a later time. As, as the prosecution has noted, as if it alleviates his obligation, he references 38,000 pages and 700 gigabytes. We received approximately, if I recall correctly, around 200 gigabytes of new information the other day. Obviously, I have not had an opportunity to go through all of it. What I can say is that there are persons on my list, on my specific request that are on the list of witnesses, and then there are persons that are left off of their witness list. But that doesn't, ob that doesn't relieve the obligation of the prosecutor to provide specifically his specific communication, whether again, text message, emails, recordings, voicemails, facsimiles, emails, whatever they are, in his direct communication with these individuals. What, what is unique in this case, in, in, in the, in the in my time in practicing criminal law, very rarely does the prosecutor go out and initiate contact personally with these witnesses. We have that in droves in this case, and those statements given by those witnesses to this prosecutor, whether they be, again, by face-to-face, -face, email, text message, whatever, are subject to being produced. He has put himself of his own free will in that situation, and as such, we haven't had a response that would satisfy the requirements to respond to this discovery. The discovery we received in general did not include 
personal communication, at least as I've seen of the 200 gigabytes, the personal communication between Mr. Wood and these witnesses. All right, thank you, Mr. Means. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wood, I'll get your response now. I would like you to address the, the timeline here, noting that these discovery requests were filed December 17th. The objection was then filed on January 8th. Um, as has been pointed out, the rule states that uh, if you don't make a response or an objection within 14 days under 16F2, that constitutes a waiver of objections. There is a provision to allow uh, under, I think it's rule F2, for an exception to that, but that is upon a showing of good cause. In the brief you filed uh, on page seven, you indicated uh, that the state requests the court in its discretion pursuant to 16 F2 find good cause that the state has not waived its right to object. I didn't see any facts or support for the good cause, just simply a request for good cause. So um, if you'd please address the timing of your objection and what you believe are grounds for good cause because they're not stated in the objection. Okay. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, the timeline laid out by Mr. Means was correct. We were eight days uh, behind in our response. The good cause, as is uh, quite frankly, Your Honor, is that this motion to compel and the underlying re discovery request um, are totally improper are illegal and they fell on their face for, for four reasons. Um, the request for discovery is absolutely outside the scope of Rule 16 and Idaho law. The request for discovery blatantly violates Rule 16's work product provisions uh, or provision. Uh, three, it's an attempt to turn a mere eight day delay into authority for the court to grant an improper motion uh, that has no grounds in law and four, it's attempting to relitigate issues already decided by the court. Um, so for the good cause, Your Honor, starting Mr. substance of- oh. Mr. Wood, so you, what, what you're saying is because, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is you've got objections to them and the rule specifically says you waive those objections if you don't timely respond. I guess I'm wondering why there wasn't a quick response saying, these are outside the scope of 16 and we're not going to comply instead of waiting until after and now arguing that because they're so far outside of 16, we, we didn't need to respond in time. I don't know that that would fall under grounds of uh, mm -hmm. an objection or a, a ground for under the rule of that exception. Um, well, Your Honor, the, the rule I think is quite broad unless otherwise ordered by the court on a showing of good cause or excusable neglect. Your Honor, I, we, like I said, we, have, we acknowledge we were eight days late. Uh, it was a mere eight days. Um, I've actually never seen someone file a motion to compel that quickly afterwards. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I've just never seen someone do that. Uh, usually there's a follow-up. I would note that the time frame in which uh, this happened, uh, as Mr. Means said, was during the same time frame they're trying trying to disqualify the prosecutor, um, and so, as I acknowledge, yes, we were eight days late. I think it is falls within good cause or excusable neglect. Um, the eight days in that time frame, and then I do think the court is absolutely allowed to consider the underlying request in determining whether or not there's good cause or excusable neglect. There's nothing in the rule that says the court can't. Uh, in fact, it's broad and wide open. Um, and so I think the court can absolutely look at the underlying illegality of this request in, in considering good cause or excusable neglect. All right. I just, I guess I'm wondering what you would consider the rule to mean when it says it constitutes a waiver of any objections. Well, I, Your Honor, if we, I, I think if we continue to just not respond and uh, continue to do that. Yeah, I can see how you'd get to a waiver. Um, again, a mere eight days for responding to something that's totally illegal, um, totally unprecedented and not allowed at all by law. Um, I don't think, and, and specifically precluded by law, I'd point out, 
I don't think that the, the defense can turn that eight days into authority to say, oh, the state has no grounds to object to this um, when what they're asking for is specifically precluded by law. All right, um, onto the requests themselves, uh, Mr. Wood, I, I, and I have read your brief in opposition. I would like you to address uh, what you think is discoverable under um, Rule 16 uh, B6, where they've asked for a list of witnesses or potential witnesses, and what is the state's argument in terms of what's uh, discoverable. There's a list of witnesses that were provided by the defense and looking at that rule, as I read it, it states that uh, if somebody uh, is going to be called or may be called by the state, then um, you need to disclose any statements those people have made. So uh, what is your response to the request to have that information provided? Your Honor, I agree that statements by witnesses need to be provided. We're not saying they don't. Every conversation with the prosecutor and a potential witness does not produce a statement. Um, if the court looks, and this is federal, so it's not necessarily binding, uh, the Jenks Act and um, uh, I think it's Goldberg versus United States, and I can get that citation for the court later. A statement is, some, is, is something that a, a witness ascribes to, they adopt, put their name on, there's specific um, requirements for that. Uh, if you're just meeting with a witness and going over testimony that they've already given to a, uh, a law enforcement officer, I have never once seen that be considered a statement that's discoverable unless they say something different, give an inconsistent statement or make a Brady statement. Uh, other than that, that's not considered as a statement to be produced. I've, I've never seen that requested like that, Your Honor. And I, I guess I'm a little bit in the dark here because as I mentioned, this addendum B, I don't know what names are included on there and whether or not the names that were specified in the discovery request are included in addendum B. Um, just looking at rule 16 B6, and I'll just read it. On written request of the defendant, the prosecuting attorney must furnish to the defendant a written list of the names and addresses of all persons having knowledge of the relevant facts who may be called by the state as witnesses at the trial. Uh, and then it says some other things uh, that the prosecuting attorney must also furnish on written request the statements made by the prosecution witnesses or prospective prosecution witnesses to the prosecuting attorney or the prosecuting attorney's agents. So. I guess, at least in my mind, that rule would envision that you would need to disclose discussions you've had, at least by naming the people you have talked to in the case as people if you concluded that they would be a prosecution witness, potential witness, or as the rule states, anyone having knowledge of relevant facts of the case. So I do understand there's an issue of the scope, and I don't want the scope to be too broad. But have you, in fact, gone through that list of names and determined or provided that to Mr. Means in terms of whether or not you've discussed that, whether or not those people have relevant knowledge of the facts of the case? You're on, um, we have provided countless police reports that have the statements of those witnesses. Um, so I would say, yes, we have. Uh, have I gone through and specifically said, I met with this person and I think they have relevant information. No, I have not done that. Uh, I don't think that's what's anticipated by rule 16 at all. I think that's totally outside of rule 16. And, and your honor, we did, as he said, we did provide a witness list. All right, um, Mr. Manger. Rebuttal argument, if any. Yeah, I do, Your Honor. First off, I'll object to anything the prosecutor has argued that is outside of his response. Secondly, I'll, I'll notice ironically and right up front that there's no denial by this prosecution that he's had personal conversations with these witnesses and that these statements have been given. He just doesn't want to produce them. Uh, he, he wants to attempt to define 
limit the definition of statement when we don't live in a world that is just pen and ink. It, it is literally statements can come in through text messages, voicemails, emails, recordings. If you look at my request, that's specifically what we requested is all of this communication. Again, and, and if we, we want to talk about an unprecedented situation, I've never seen a situation in which a prosecutor has injected himself in personally with the witnesses as he has in this case. I mean, we learned in the summer shiftlet transcript that he's asking him to say what he wants to say. He's, he's giving him his theory of his case. They're both making mitigating, substantial mitigating statements that are relevant to this case. And as I said, one of the first witnesses, if this went to trial tomorrow would be Mr. Wood because of the mitigating st statements that he's making to other witnesses and making himself a witness. Here we have a specific set of persons that are relevant, that are witnesses or prospective witnesses in this case. We specifically ask for his communication with these individuals. We've given him multiple opportunities to explain them if he doesn't have them in writing. I met with this person. This person said this. This person said this. It, the, the issue that, that we really are taking at risk here is if there is something mitigating in the conversation between Mr. Wood and these witnesses or any other individuals, that it comes up at a later time. And then we're faced with another motion to disqualify, appeals, uh, we're, we're negating the credibility of the process by not holding him to the rules. As they, as he argues now, the objections are waived. He has to respond to the discovery. He had plenty opportunities to respond before, as the court has pointed out, and he chose not to. What we've asked is very specific. It doesn't even, even if the court was looking under the work product doctrine or the work product definition limitations, it says, in, 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 in G of Rule 16, legal research, correspondence, reports of memorandums, and even the reports of memorandums are limited when they have opinions, theories, or conclusions of the prosecuting attorney. We didn't use any of that language in our request. Text messages, emails, voice recordings, face-to-face uh, -face conversations, internet, Facebook, whatever it is. This prosecutor has injected himself with these witnesses. There are, and he has not denied, private communications between himself and these witnesses. And we have the right to those statements, whether they're his or whether they are the prospective witnesses or the actual witnesses. We have not received those to date, Your Honor. So we would ask again that the court grant this motion, give a shortened, reasonable time to respond and consider the, the argument for sanctions as a matter to deter this behavior in the future. Judge, I'd like to make a comment if I may. And I would like to respond to that as well, Your Honor. Yeah, before I get to you, Mr. Fryer, I didn't intend to maybe uh, cut off Mr. Wood. I was in the middle of some issues, but maybe not necessarily the full argument. So I'll allow additional argument from Mr. Wood on the motion. And then uh, Mr. Fryer, I'll allow you to comment as well after that. So Mr. Wood, any, any other argument you'd like to make? Yes, yeah, sure. I just, uh, again, this request for discovery is absolutely outside the scope of Rule 16. Um, and I would know it's not just this list of people he's produced. He says all persons, all persons I've ever conversed with. So if, conversed with regarding this it, case, I mean, it's if my turn to speak to now, lot, Mr. Means. If you've talked to a lot and of people, so, my obligation see, is on you, not on me. By his own writing, Hold by on his, a both of you, we're making a recording here. We also have a court reporter who has to transcribe this. Mr. Means, I'm going to admonish you: do not talk over the top of someone else, I'll allow you another response if you need one. And Mr. Wood uh, and Mr. Pryor, please abide by those same rules. So go ahead, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. By his, by his own request, if, if, if a friend said, how'd you feel about that hearing in a text? And I just said, oh, it made me tired. That would be something I'd need to disclose to Mr. Means. That's ridiculous. Um, it's unheard of that a lawyer would not meet with witnesses. That's unheard of. This idea that we aren't supposed to meet with witnesses is, is, beyond, is bizarre, it's beyond the pale, uh, and it's, it's just an, a, an attempt to, to look away from the facts of the case. Uh, the law absolutely differentiates between um, an attorney preparing their case and collecting statements and, uh, and uh, witnesses making statements. I would note, Your Honor, that the work product, he, he says he wants my emails, he wants he wants text messages. Correspondence must is part of Rule 16, and Rule 16 is adamant. Disclosure must not be required. 
So he's making a legal request. However he wants to couch it, he's making a legal request. Um, and I would point out, Your Honor, he completely ignored the proper procedure to make a request outside of um, for information not covered by Rule 16. I, I, it, there's, a, there's absolutely a difference between meeting with a witness, preparing a case, and collecting statements. He's asking for something that's not covered by Rule 16. In asking for that, Rule 16 B10 is clear. He needed to file a motion and show good cause to the court uh, why he had substantial need for the info, for that information, and why he is unable without undue hardship to obtain the substantial equivalent by other means. He did not do that. He did not file a motion. That's the proper procedure laid out in Rule 16 to get information such as this, not to file a discovery request. Um, Your Honor, and I would say that... Back up there and respond to that. So, Mr. Wood, in the motion to compel, I mean, let's get back to this request for discovery uh, and narrowing it down essentially says, here's a list of people I think may have made statements about this case to the prosecutor or the prosecutor's agents that may be witnesses. And then there's a list of people going on from, I can't count because it's in Roman numerals, but we get up to uh, 20, 27 people on there. And then um, I think that is allowed, and I think the state does have to state if there have been witness statements made to a prosecutor or their agent. So at least acknowledging, did you talk to these people? Did they make statements about the case? That's clearly uh, under the purview of Rule 16b-6, which states that the prosecuting attorney must furnish on written request statements made by the prosecution witnesses or prospective witnesses to the prosecuting attorney. So I guess the, the request is, did you talk to these people and did they say something about the case? The motion to compel on the ground says, to date the state has failed to provide any written response whatsoever. So in terms of the procedural argument that uh, there was not a proper procedural argument, I think the motion does lay out grounds saying, we asked for this information we've received no requests. And I think that shows cause then, I don't know how else the defense is supposed to get information about who the prosecution or your agents have talked to uh, if you don't answer the question about those witnesses. So uh, I'm not too concerned about a procedural defect on the side of the defense um, filing the motion to compel. I am concerned about the timeliness of your response and whether or not going down this list, you have provided or intend to provide answers as to whether or not you spoke to these people and did they provide a statement. And while I'm talking, I mean, I also understand the confines of the scope of this request and that it shouldn't be outside the scope and the work product uh, exception also applies clearly. But uh, I would see this, Mr. Wood, as a requirement that you at least acknowledge whether you talked to them, whether they gave you any relevant information about the case and a summary of what that would be. So I know I said a lot there and it's not necessarily a question, but I'd like to know uh, your response on going through that list of people on there, whether that's been provided or will be provided. Your Honor, if, if, if the court ordered us, ordered us to provide it that way, we absolutely will do whatever the court says. Uh, my concern though, is that this request uh, delves far deeper than Rule 16 allows. Um, I, 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 disagree. I don't believe that every conversation with a witness constitutes a statement. I've never heard that. I've never heard that argument. Um, and uh, again, I, that's totally unprecedented, I think, to say that every conversation with a witness is a statement. Um, and so I, obviously, Your Honor, we will comply with whatever the court orders us to comply. But I do think there are serious issues with this discovery request uh, grounded in the work product um, issue and the scope issue. Um, and we would ask that any order main, maintain that work product and, and within the scope of Rule 16. All right. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to make any statement at this point, you may. Judge, one of my concerns is that um, 
Mr. Wood has taken it upon himself in this case to define what he thinks is relevant evidence. And I'm deeply concerned about his interpretation of relevant evidence. As an example, and, and I don't wanna keep harping on this and, and, and that's not my intention here, but I am concerned because I sent out a, a formal letter to Mr. Wood and the response was basically in, 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 in most part, I don't find your requests relevant, so I'm not gonna answer them. Now, if we wanna talk about inappropriate, that's inappropriate. And Mr. Wood defining what rule 16 says is not the way this thing is supposed to proceed. Mr. Wood is to respond and provide statements from witnesses that could or even could not be uh, deemed exculpatory. And he doesn't get to decide what is relevant evidence, Judge, this court does. And the difficulty is this, Judge, is that there has been a long pattern here of getting discovery that in some cases, Judge, some of the discovery is a year old. Some of the discovery is seven months old. And the latest, Judge, I have discovery that he just sent to me on February 8th on a hard drive that's seven, eight, and nine months old. And the slow walking by Mr. Wood of providing us the evidence, I don't know if it's in the intent to, uh, to sandbag us at the end of the trial or just not give us enough time when the trial comes in July to adequately prepare for this. And it's very disconcerting, to, or it's very concerning to me. An example, uh, there was some discovery, there were some statements that I needed and at the preliminary hearing regarding evidence. After the summer shiftlet hearing, Mr. Wood made mention of some, some, some statements by a uh, material witness and said, oh, by the way, uh, these statements were made, here you are, uh, not the recording, not the police report, but oh, they happen to make these statements. Now, that, now if we wanna talk about inappropriate, that's inappropriate. And the reality is this, is that everything that Mr. Wood said about yeah. you know, outside the scope and all of his arguments are misapplied and he's misapplying the rule. It's really quite simple. Mr. Means filed a motion for some discovery. Mr. Wood did not respond in a timely manner. He waives all of his arguments at that point and the information is discoverable. Now this argument that, well, it's, it's you know, conversations I've had with witnesses. The problem with this is this judge, Summer Shiflett had a conversation with Mr. Wood and we now have a record of Summer Shiflett's conversation. Now granted it was most, mostly Mr. Wood conducting the conversation, the 20 minutes, but Summer Shiflett made some disclosures and at no time up to that hearing to disqualify him, did Mr. Wood ever provide us with the information about Summer Shiflett's disclosures, about immunity agreements, about all sorts of statements that she made on that recording that Mr. Wood, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, encouraged her to say. And, and Judge, we wouldn't have gotten that information had it not been for Garrett Smith to provide it. So for Mr. Wood now to say, oh, I'm not gonna give you information about what these witnesses say, Judge, um, maybe I'm naive, but to suggest that uh, um, there may be other statements out there that Mr. Wood has made to other witnesses that could affect this case, they are absolutely out there. And Mr. Wood is obligated to turn over the dates of the conversations he's had with these witnesses, the content, and whether there is an audio, video, or paper recording of those conversations. I, I wasn't intending to be this long-winded, but judge, I need an order fashioned in a way that says, Mr. Wood, you will provide the names of the witnesses that you've interviewed or talked to in this case. Anybody that you've mentioned in this case in terms of part of your process of this, the content of those conversations and whether there's an audio, video, paper recording, date, time, place, he needs to return those in judge and it needs to be specific because with all respect to Mr. Wood, he applies his own standard of what is discoverable and what is relevant. And I strongly disagree with everything he says about what is relevant and what is discoverable. And I have a letter and I anticipate we'll be filing a motion on behalf of Mr. Daybell and we'll be visiting this issue again because Mr. Wood has his own interpretation of what is relevant evidence. And, and it's not based on rule 16 in my opinion. So I am asking the court 
to specifically identify all of the factors I just relayed. Because I don't want to give Mr. Wood the opportunity to say, well, I kind of complied, but you know, I didn't have to give all of this stuff because I'm deciding what's relevant and what's not. At this point, Judge, I don't believe we can trust Mr. Wood to make the determination of what's relevant. And the reason we can't trust him is because of Summer Shiflett. And at this point, I, I strongly encourage the court to grant Mr. Means motion and the court fashion and order exactly what Mr. Wood has to provide. Thank you, Judge. All right, well, Mr. Pryor, I'll note you don't have a pending motion to compel um, the prosecutor, obviously, has an ongoing duty to make disclosures for discovery requests in this case. But in terms of you requesting a specific order, uh, you've got to get a motion filed and a hearing if you want that from the court. Uh, I know you have an interest in discovery disclosures like Mr. Means, but I'm not making any order specific to Mr. Daybell today because there's no pending motion. But Judge, I'm not asking. I'm Paul Jeff. I'm not asking for a report to Mr. Daybell. I'm asking it in terms of Mr. Means because if Mr. Wood provides it to Mr. Means, he also has to provide it to me. And 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 I'm seeking the same information. My hope is that it would have come by way of uh, of, of of discovery that was under he was using it under his his obligation. But at this point, uh, we're not going to get that stuff unless the court fashions an order in the ballot portion. So I'm asking on behalf of Mr. Means that the well, I guess not on behalf of Mr. Means. Mr. Means can speak for himself, but that order needs to be uh, narrowly tailored to direct Mr. Wood uh, to do this. And, and Judge, we are going to be revisiting this issue in the future, in, in the short future, regarding more discovery. All right. Mr. Wood, um, I'll allow any comment or response to that argument made by Mr. Pryor, if you'd like. Well, I, I certainly disagree with him that it's my version of relevance that counts or that I said that in a letter. Um, I, I find it odd we, we made what I believe he's referring to as a Brady disclosure and said the report will be coming and we've sent that report. He sent me a letter saying, what about audio visual? And I said, if I will look for it and send it. And so this idea that the state's withholding evidence from Mr. Pryor or Mr. Means, I think is ridiculous, it's repugnant, it's not grounded in fact. Um, and I'll leave that at that. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Well, I have considered this motion to compel. There's been uh, briefs filed on both sides as well as the request for discovery uh, that was filed on December 17th. The state did file an objection. The objection was not filed timely. The court has discretion under Rule 16 F2 to consider or not whether the objections are waived or whether any sanctions should be imposed. Uh, in criminal cases, oftentimes, unfortunately, there are delays. I don't find any grounds at all to even consider sanctions since we do have requests and we're here at the hearing. Typically, sanctions are ordered when you're sitting here and all this time's passed and there's still been nothing provided. Um, there are, however, some concerns about uh, the objections. I would note those weren't filed timely. And to the extent a discovery request would be beyond the scope of what's allowed under Rule 16, the court wouldn't order it whether it was objected to or not, because 16 just provides the parameters for what's involved in a response to discovery and what needs to be provided. If it's too broad, if it's overly burdensome, if it's not reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable or relevant evidence, then the court's not going to impose that burden on someone to have to provide that even if they uh, fail to timely object. So in looking at this motion to compel, uh, I will grant the motion in terms of requiring that the state provide a response to the question as to whether or not uh, the prosecution has discussed the case with those persons identified in the list that starts on line 16 on page two of the discovery request. I'm gonna make an exception and not require a response to parts 25, 26, and 27 of the list as I find those are too broad and not reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence or, or uh, relevant evidence. 
for purposes of the defense in this case. Uh, in terms of the other persons, I think those do clearly fall under a response required under Rule 16b-6, which again states that prosecuting attorney must furnish statements made by prosecution witnesses or prospective witnesses to the prosecuting attorney or the prosecuting attorney's agents. So in this response, Mr. Wood, I'm not requiring you to divulge any work product. That would not be your handwritten notes. Uh, if there are any written statements you received from any of these people that are identified as witnesses or potential witnesses, those would need to be provided. And if you did talk to them and they provided any information uh, in terms of statements regarding relevant facts of the case, then I would require you to provide a summary of what those statements were as they relate to the case. So Mr. Wood, what would be a reasonable time for you to make that uh, disclosure to the defense? I'd say 14 days, Your Honor. All right, I'll allow that 14 day time frame to respond to that. And essentially, Mr. Wood, a summary of whether or not you met those people and whether they told you anything of relevance about the case or, or the state's agents. I think that is discoverable under 16B. So that'll be my ruling on the motion to compel. Uh, Council, we've got another motion then on the motion for uh, client attorney communications. Um, Council, before we take that motion up, why don't we take about a 10 minute recess, let my court reporter take a quick break and then we'll hear the next motion. Uh, any questions on my ruling on the motion to compel Mr. Means or Mr. Wood? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Means, I would ask you that you uh, prepare an order for the court to sign in accordance with my ruling today. We'll do, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, we'll be in recess then for about. Uh, Your Honor, we we would, if we, if it's possible, we'd like to see the order before it's signed. All right, if you'd provide a courtesy copy of that first to Mr. Wood. Uh, and why don't you put a signature line on for Mr. Wood to approve. Can't agree on the terms of the order. I'll go back and look at the record of what I said and uh, either modify the order or just receive it by Mr. Means. You can do that, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, we'll be in recess then. Uh, let's take a 15 minute break and we'll be back on the record. All right, looks like we've got everybody back. Um, 
We'll be back on the record, KCR 2220-838, State v. Corey Vallon. This fellow is represented by Attorney Mark Means. Rob Wood representing the state. We took a break after the first motion we heard this morning. This will be the time now to hear the motion on defendants declared motion for an order directing attorney-client privilege communications. That was filed on January 19th, and the courts reviewed that as well as the state's response, which was filed on February 12th. Mr. Means, are you ready to present argument on the motion? I am, Your Honor. All right, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as the cited in the motion, I think the Sixth Amendment is, is applicable here in my client's right to counsel. Furthermore, embedded in the Sixth Amendment is a right to a fair trial and a fair process. And as cited, the case law of a rough equality, uh, our Sixth Amendment requires fairness of rough equality between adversarial opponents. In, in, in what we're dealing with here is, is somewhat, and I can acknowledge an unprecedented time in what our country is going through. But at the same time, there have to be certain safeguards that have to be in place, especially regarding such a case that receives such public attention. My client has been in the Madison Detention Center since approximately February to February. So we're dealing about 12 months. Over the course of this 12 months, approximately six of these months, I have been denied access to my client to visit with her in an attorney client room. We've had at least three recorded phone conversations after multiple representations that have not been recorded that have been leaked in one way or another. And there's some dispute over this, but one way or another making their way to the prosecutor's office and or to the detectives for the prosecutor. I, I will cite that in the in response of the state, they reference a May 9th phone call that I'm not familiar with. That might be a fourth call that I need to look into. Again, issues with attorney client privilege communications. We're also in the Madison Detention Center dealing with uh, video cameras that are front and back that are recording the communications. Uh, there's an entire clear glass wall where deputies are outside able to watch the communication uh, and the interaction between the clients. Um, anytime I call my client, she has two options. One, she can stand at the desk with the deputy as I cited with about two feet handcuffed to a phone call with the deputy standing right next to her or approximately 15 or so feet away. She's on a recorded phone line through Telmate, and obviously we've had issues with that before cited, I think by both sides. Um, I, there's pictures attached to my affidavit that show the circumstances in which I'm having to meet with my client in this situation. And as cited by the prosecution, we have tens of thousands of pages, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes. And, and now I am supposed to meet with my client on a recorded phone client line, which I'm being told again is not being recorded, but I was told that before when it was recorded on a stool about 18 inches off the ground behind two inches of glass with a phone that you have to input a code about every 10 or 15 minutes to continue the conversations. This is not, I think in good faith with the fairness requirements. I think if we clearly look at it and say, um, if the prosecutor had to prepare his case under these circumstances, uh, they would be complaining about the same thing. Now, what's interesting is if we look at the treatment of Mr. Daybell in Fremont County, which is approximately, if you look at detention center to detention center, about 13 miles away, and, and Mr. Pryor can speak more to this, but it's my understanding, Mr. Daybell's been incarcerated for nine months. He's had zero alleged allegations of recorded phone calls zero interference with his client attorney privilege communication, zero denial to see his client, zero video cameras recording him, uh, and zero phone calls with deputies around him. This is obviously drastically different when we're dealing with roughly the same facts and the same charges. I think there could be an argument made, and I'm a little concerned with this, that the Madison Detention Center houses the female inmates for Fremont and for Madison's by understanding, and Fremont Detention Center houses the males. We're treating them differently I think there could be an argument for potential gender discrimination. And again, I'm trying to avoid that in the future, but we do have an issue here uh, with the access or fairness of the process. I have to point out that each of the time that ap what appears to be arbitrarily denied access to my client to meet with her in attorney client room, it's coincides with one, my motion to reduce bond that brought up the uh, recorded phone calls before and two, the motion to disqualify the prosecutor. Um, and point out specifically since filing this motion, the last time I saw my client in Madison when I requested to see her in the, in the attorney client room, I was told by the deputies that I have to get an order. And that was it. I objected, I said, hey, look, I wanna visit with her. 
I, I've had them test me for temperature, wear a mask, sit six feet apart. We've complied with all of that. There is no evidence to say we haven't complied with that. And given the extreme amount of information and evidence in this case, it is impossible at this point in time, and given the six months that I've been denied, to prepare an adequate defense and to work with the evidence that we have with my client in these circumstances. We, I've asked for a few things that, in all reality, I really shouldn't have to ask to visit with my client. But given the circumstances of COVID, kind of looking at it from a unique perspective of what we're dealing with here, if the state or the courts are gonna allow the prosecutor or detention centers to make restrictions on attorney-client privilege, I think Lady Liberty would require that we also consider making some adjustments to accommodate for those restrictions. What I've asked for here is one, that I'd be allowed to visit with my client in the attorney-client room. Two, I've cited the case law, and I think it's well-established, nonverbal communication is communication. Communication between an attorney and a client is protected. These video cameras, they're watching these video cameras. They've been referenced in one or two of the affidavits filed by the prosecution when they complained that I took pictures of the situation in which we are in. They watch these videos. Um, I, I know that they have watched other videos with my client. I've asked that they be turned off. And, and thirdly, I think a cell phone provided at the expense of the defense with some severe limitations on the cell phone would be appropriate. There's case law and the court is probably well aware of this, that there's case law that when a prosecution or the agents of the prosecution uh, have access to recorded phone calls or privileges, um, that cases can ultimately be dismissed. And what we have here is at least three, maybe four, based on the representation here of some recorded phone calls that in one way or the other, I don't think we have to have that argument today as far as who's at fault, one way or the other has made their way to the prosecutor or to the, the detectives in this case. If we allow them to continue to have that opportunity after I'm being told that I'm not being recorded and it happens again, we're gonna be in an awkward situation where potentially the case will be requested to be dismissed. And I don't think the prosecutor wants to take that risk. And so in requesting a cell phone, there are now cell phones available today that do not have text message capability. They do not have internet capability. They can be extremely limited to the phone number in which they can access. What we would propose is one that the court allow me unrestricted access as I should have to my client in the attorney client room. Two, that these video cameras be turned off. Three, that she be given a cell phone that she can use much like the laptop to review the evidence in this case, limited to my phone number only, no internet access, no text message, none of these type of things, I think, which the prosecutor expressed some concerns over. And it would be my obligation to find and make sure that that happens. If we're able to do that, I think it benefits the attorney-client privilege and makes it more realistic uh, and the ability to prepare a, a fair defense and at the same time, it would turn around and alleviate the pressures from the prosecution that in the event that is the recording turned off, is it not turned off, did Mr. was Mr. Means recorded? I don't wanna to have to go down that road if we don't have to, Your Honor. So it's, it's somewhat saddening that we have to come and ask the court for this type of order, but I'm being told blatantly and right up front that without it, I'm not gonna have access to my client like I should. So we'd ask the court to enter an order to that effect. All right, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Means. So over this past year, well, let me just make sure I understand the layout of where you're meeting with your client in the jail. So there's, as I understand it, a separate, what they call attorney-client room, where you can have a face-to-face -face meeting with an inmate. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And then the photograph you showed in your exhibit would be the visiting room where there are phones and the plexiglass barrier, correct? Correct, and, it, and if you look at the picture of, of what is behind my client is the room that they use for the attorney client privilege room. So you have the glass there that shows into the, the, uh, the, the, the desk of the, of the deputies and then you have behind that room where the public would come in and visit. All right, so over the last 12 months then um, you have had face-to-face -face meetings with your client in the attorney-client room, is that correct? I have, Your Honor. And then it, it, it's, and this is where I, I'm, I'm trying to be reasonable here. The, the 
that coincide with the restrictions is, is as I said, is, is timely with these motions that I filed that I, I think the prosecutor of the state probably do not like. Um, and I've had this, I've been allowed, they tested me for high temperature. They made me wear masks. They say sit, sit six feet apart. And there's been no allegations of any violation of that before. But then, and then specifically back in March, COVID restrictions didn't change. Just all of a sudden I was told I couldn't go see my client. And then come June 6, where there was some development in the Daybell property, a phone call was made after my conversation with Mr. Wood that said, oh, they're still doing that. They won't allow you. Let me call them. And I was allowed free access to my client at that time in the attorney client room. And the only thing that changed was the phone call. Then come January, motion to disqualify, all of a sudden I can't go in and change. Now, it's my understanding that Fremont County and Madison County are under the same health districts. And we're talking about a 13 mile difference and a drastically different set of circumstances and treatment when it comes to access to the client. Mr. Means, when did you last have a meeting with your client in the attorney client room? Ooh, uh, would have been before Jan. I don't have the date in front of me, but it was well before January. I would imagine it'd be sometime in December. Okay. I when I went over there in January to discuss the disqualification motion, that's when I, I don't receive a phone call. So I don't know when they're turning these restrictions on. I show up and I'm told I can't go in. And that would have been January was the last one uh, regarding the motion to disqualify. All right, thanks, Mr. Means. Mr. Wood, I'll ask for your response. And if you would, um, in the first paragraph of your response, you indicated you don't object to the request to meet in person. So to clarify that, does that mean that the state has no objection to him continuing to have access to the attorney client room if it's available? Yeah, we, we don't object to that. We never have. As Mr. Means said himself, he called me one time and I, I called the jail to help him. He hasn't called me these other times. I didn't even know about it. I didn't know he wasn't able to meet with her. Um, I'm, I'm certainly uh, going to uh, address this issue that it, it coincided with motions we didn't like. I don't tell the jail to not let people see their attorneys. I've never done that. Um, and so I just want to be very, very clear about that. I would never do that. I've never done that. Um, I think even saying that without some evidence is, is pretty out there. Um, so in terms of meeting, no, we've never had an objection to a meeting with his client and we don't object to that now. Um, in terms of uh, turning off security cameras, uh, in my response, I know that the, the jail is able to draw a virtual black box around people. Uh, we, I don't think that uh, we, we do object to the idea of just turning off security cameras in general. Uh, I've never received a request like that from any other attorney. Um, I, and so we would ask if he can work with the jail uh, to make sure they're not being watched, but to turn off the security cameras is overboard. In terms of the cell phone, uh, your honor, that this is a I, I've never, this is another, I've never seen a request like this. I've never seen another attorney have these issues with their client. Um, the, the May 9th phone call, this is the first phone call that Mr. Means was made aware of. Uh, it was right after she was brought, uh, Miss, Mrs. Vallow Daybell was brought to the Madison County Jail. Um, and Mr. Means didn't turn his number into the jail. And so they didn't know to block the number. I turned that number in for him. Um, so if you were to if you were to call him again on that number, it's blocked. It's not going to be recorded. Um, on the uh, the other two days that he's talked about, or the other day that he's talked about those two calls, they received a warning that um, they were being recorded. They they put him because of COVID, put him in that attorney uh, or in the general visiting room. The day before, they had told him that he could have it turned off and it was turned off on March 30th. On March 31st, when he went in and heard that warning, they didn't say anything. So that's not, it's not a privileged phone call. Um, by law, it's not. And so now here's, the, we don't wanna listen to their phone calls. We don't, I agree with Mr. Means, we don't want their phone calls. Uh, it's just working tell me. It's, Again, I, I don't, we haven't had any other attorney make this request. Everyone else has been able to make it work. And I, I do agree with Mr. Means, COVID is frustrating and difficult. 
uh, and I do agree he should be able to meet in person with his client. Um, we we object to, uh, I, I think once you give one inmate a cell phone, uh, that's not a slippery slope, you're jumping off a cliff and everybody else is gonna want a cell phone. Um, and I don't know by what grounds you would deny that. So um, we do object to the cell phone and uh, to a blanket uh, order to turn off security cameras, we, we object to that. That's all, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Means, any rebuttal argument? Yeah, just you, real brief, Your Honor. The the black box option. This is the first that this has been brought up to me. I, I, I've requested every time that I've gone in there that they turn off the recordings, and I've I've been told no. I think the black box option, if I could see what the screen looks like, would probably be a reasonable result here instead of turning off the two cameras that are face to face. I, I worry about obviously in the prosecution and the deputies watching the tape, if the, if the camera's right in your face and they, and they can read what you're talking about, there's obviously a violation there. And we know that they've watched the tape. Um, on, the, on these recorded phone calls, I think it's important to note that prior to going in on March 30 and March 31st, the deputy and the, and the detention center said, and they put signs out that they have changed the public room to an attorney client room only, and the recordings were turned off. And so that, that's a point of clarification that we can probably discuss at a later time. But to have to go in and request that they not record each time when you're told that they're not recording and they've changed the room is, is a little uh, a misdirection. I, I think, again, Your Honor, with COVID, given the history here with, again, and without pointing your fingers, recordings have happened. They have been released to deputies. They have been accessed by deputies. They have been accessed by the prosecutor's office without getting into that issue. There's still some outstanding discovery on that issue. Um, I think a cell phone extremely limited to only being able to call me at the cost of the defendant would be relevant given the current restrictions that we're under. Now, when the COVID restrictions are, are, are lifted uh, and you don't have a client that is handcuffed to a desk uh, that has to speak literally two feet to their attorney, two feet away from a deputy, I, I think we can revisit that issue, but I don't think it's a slippery slope given all the exceptions that we're making to accommodate the, the COVID restrictions right now. All right, thank you, Mr. Means. I'll note, I'll Your Honor, can I just briefly? Yes. Um, from my understanding when uh, there's, Mrs. Daybell is allowed to go into a room privately when she speaks over the telemate system with her attorney. That's what the jail has informed me so that she is not within earshot of a deputy. All right. There's no phone in that attorney client room, Your Honor, that can call out to myself. It is literally at the desk where the deputy is or at the phone about 10, 15 feet from that desk. So when she's in that attorney client room, the only phone that there is able to call out to the public uh, access room that that you can see in the pictures. Uh, so she hasn't had she hasn't been allowed to have a conversation with me other than on those two phones. Okay. Uh, the court has considered the motion. Then uh, I'd note that the policies that are implemented in the jails, the court defers to those. Uh, there's obviously some precedent out there. Uh, I'd cite to State versus Jacobson, 150 Idaho, 131. That's a 2010 case that says prison and jail administrators have a compelling interest in establishing necessary regulations and procedures to maintain good order, security, and discipline. And I would note in these times also the uh, safety of the health of both inmates and the jail staff. Um, I've been advised during COVID of the uh, policies that have had to be changed in some respect in order to try to prevent COVID outbreaks from occurring in the jail. And the jail has been pretty successful in doing that here in Madison County. And so I don't substitute my decision making in terms of uh, some of these access issues for the general policies that are promulgated by the people that are running the jail. Um, however, obviously, the inmates are allowed to have privileged attorney-client communications, and that's a paramount right of every incarcerated defendant. In considering the motion, um, it's made some specific requests, and I'll go through those. 
uh, the state doesn't object to the use of the attorney client room. <clears throat> and I do understand Mr. Means been in your shoes before and trying to go through a bunch of documents and in particular electronic things on a laptop. You really do need to be able to kind of sit with the client and, and uh, share that information with them to adequately review that. So the, there is an attorney client room in the jail to the extent that's available. Um, I don't know that I need to make a specific order because that's been implemented, but uh, I will make a ruling that subject to the availability of that room without the objection of the state. Um, when you travel here to visit with your client, Mr. Means, you are allowed to use the attorney client room unless the jail has some overriding policy that on a particular trip, the room's not available. But also considering you're traveling from a long ways away to see your client, that room should be made available and that's not a special consideration for your client. I would allow that for any client uh, of any attorney that's incarcerated an attorney traveling where it's a big inconvenience if the room's not available. So I suggest you make a uh, plan with the jail and advise them of when you're going to be there to see if they can sort of, I don't know that they reserve the room, but be advised that the room uh, you'd like to use it and that will be allowed. The other issues involving the video and the cell phone, in terms of the video, uh, there are security reasons why video should uh, be in place for both attorneys and clients in the jail. Uh, the jail sets those policies, I'm not gonna make any order that the video be turned off. I'm not aware of this technology, Mr. Wood, stated is there to potentially black box somebody out so you can't maybe read their lips or see what they're saying. Um, clearly any audio recordings are not allowed in the attorney-client privilege communications within the jail um, since those would violate that privilege if, if there was audio recordings. I understand it inadvertently happened before in this case and I just asked the state to make every effort to make sure that that issue doesn't come up again. And then finally, on the request for the cell phone, I'm going to deny that request. Uh, I understand why that would be a convenience for you, Mr. Means, but that I think goes way outside of the scope of what the jail policies would be. If the jail came up with a way to allow that right for certain inmates, uh, not exclusive to yours, I'd leave that to them. As the state pointed out, um, an electronic telecommunication device is considered a major contraband item under um, Idaho Code 182510 and allowing a particular inmate to have their own personal cell phone uh, is something I'm not prepared to order in this case or any other case, quite frankly. So that part of the request would be denied. So that would be my ruling on the motion for access to the client. Um, Mr. Means, do you have any questions on my ruling? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Mr. Wood, do you have any questions or need any clarification on that? No, Your Honor. All right. I think that concludes what we had to cover today then, counsel. Uh, is there anything else we need to bring up on this case this morning, Mr. Wood? Um, no, no, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Means, anything further this morning? No, Your Honor. Mr. Pryor, do you have anything further? Nothing further, Judge. All right. Thanks for your attendance, everyone. We will be in recess. Thank you, Your Honor.